Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the National Parliamentary Library of Georgia and to welcome our speaker, Georgi Kandilaki, former Member of Parliament, author, and project manager for the Soviet Past Research Laboratory here in DC. Georgi will delve into the historical and political context of the rehabilitation of Stalin's memory in Georgia. This strange and dangerous phenomenon has manifested itself in the unveiling of 11 new statues of the former dictator in recent years. Georgi will shed light on the role of the Russian government in manipulating attitudes towards Stalin in modern Georgia through calculated information warfare. Russia's disinformation campaign serves the Russian interest of hindering Georgia's move towards the West. And Georgi will discuss how the Russian government has leveraging Stalin's Georgian background to slow the country's westward progress. I hope you enjoy, and I will now pass you over to Georgi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, thanks for inviting me uh, here. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and thank you for uh, to any, whoever is responsible for relocating this program to to Georgia. To that is to Ben again. Uh, I think that's terrific for for Georgia, and I hope that is useful for you. So I'm going to talk today about how. Um, how uh, the personality of Stalin is being weaponized by what is popularly referred to as uh, Russian information warfare and their networks uh, in Georgia. So the long-term uh, project or strategic project of, of the Russian information warfare in Georgia is to cultivate a kind of anti-Western uh, ethno-religious strait of Georgian nationalism uh, in order to sow sort of discord between the Georgian society and Western civilization, to present the Western civilization as some, some sort of threat that uh, endangers our identity, religion, um, and so forth. In this strategic project, which of course has been uh, there for a long time, there are of course various uh, components, and many of those components would be rather familiar to you. One such component, obviously, which is not unique to Georgia, would be the weaponization of the LGBT question, without doubt. Um, and, uh, and other uh, examples may also uh, come up that, uh, that would be familiar. But there is one, this one component of, of specifically Stalin, which the Russian information warfare and their agents of their influence, uh, so to speak, have successfully tailored specifically to the reality uh, uh, of Georgia in order to serve that purpose, the cultivation of anti-Western nativist or nativism or nativist nationalism, how, however uh, you call it. And one has to give them credit because this uh, project, this undertaking has been successful. It has been successful and we can, there are ways to measure this success. It is also striking that this success has largely unfolded under the Western radar. It has already been mentioned, the emergence in the recent uh, years, the emergence of 11 new statues of Joseph Stalin. That is a big deal. I mean, uh, uh, I mean uh, a big deal, and unfortunately, it hasn't really received much attention. Imagine what would happen if one statue of Hitler would emerge in, in Austria. There would be a tsunami <laughs> in the media. But sadly, of course, that, that leads us to another problem of difficulty. Of, uh, of contextualizing the two totalitarian, totalitarian regimes of the 20th century just because the Soviet Union won in the Second World War. But that's another subject that, that is not the focus of our discussion today. But nevertheless, 11 new statues, that, that is a, a symptom. And of course, these statues have not you know, fallen out of the blue sky. The emergence of these statues specifically now, specifically in recent years, is uh, is uh, indicative of certain tendency in our society, that these statues have emerged not before, but now. Uh, another way to measure it uh, is, of course, uh, uh, the public opinion polls. We have, we have we're now trying to um, get some money to do a big poll, but we have bits and pieces uh, in different, different um, surveys you know, when some friends do survey, we ask them to integrate a couple of questions on, on Stalin. And without doubt, we can measure the, uh, the, the increase in, in popularity of, uh, of Stalin. For example, there is a poll uh, from last year. Uh, there is a, 
so there is a coalition of NGOs which uh, work on the questions of disinformation and my, my organization is part of this coalition. It's, it's run by the, a, a British organization which is called Zinc Network by the way, but it's a, it's a, it's a USID project. So they commissioned uh, a poll on disinformation last year in which 46% of Georgians say that a patriotic Georgian should be proud of Stalin. Uh, uh, in this year's poll, there was a 12% uptick uh, amongst Georgians and the overall figure is uh, around under 40% who say that uh, Georgian culture was better protected during the Soviet period when Georgia didn't exist, <laughs> which mirrors this, this uh, propaganda that, uh, that the European Union and, and, and uh, the United States, uh, there is a conspiracy to destroy our culture. There is a slightly older poll, um, specifically on Stalin, a, a very, very good poll, which, which shows that uh, around 38%, up to 40% say that they heard only or mostly good things about Stalin at school, and around the same number say, say, uh, say the same on family. So it's not only about what's written in textbooks, although that is of course very important, but it's also the word of mouth. What do the teachers you know, believe? Uh, so the way, uh, oh, and of course the question of religion, and, and I'll go back, go, go back to that uh, at several uh, occasions in my talk. The question of religion and the attitude of the Georgian Orthodox Church towards uh, Stalin. So in the same poll, around 40% say that uh, Stalin was a, a secret Christian and patron of the church. And so for someone to convince almost half of the society into such an utter lie, it is a success. By any means, it means that somebody worked uh, successfully. Of course, as in every uh, propaganda undertaking, uh, propaganda takes something that already exists and then amplifies. So don't get me wrong that this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, sentiments in the Georgian society were not existent. They were existent. Particularly their roots go back to 1950s and the events of March 1956 when uh, after the tw 20th Congress of the Communist Party and destalinization, launch of the destalinization, um, there were riots, there were demonstrations that were shot at, people died, and the sentiment in the society at the time was that the, 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 the Georgianness of Stalin was, uh, was, uh, uh, was, uh, was one of the drivers of this crackdown. And so this, this tendency originates in 1956. By the way, this, uh, this dramatic slight deviation from my uh, topic, uh, the events of 1956 also illustrates the vulnerability of youth towards propaganda. In 1956, you had young people in the street who grew up during Stalin, who knew nothing else but Stalin, uh, who were sort of brainwashed with this crazy, crazy propaganda about Stalin being, being superhuman, you know, savior of, of the world and, and so forth, while their fathers just one generation earlier uh, in this country fought and shed blood against Stalin when Stalin engineered the Soviet-Russian invasion of Georgia um, in, in, number, in number of wars against the Soviet Russia and its proxies and of course most prominently in the 1924 anti-Bolshevik uprising uh, which claimed lives of thousands of Georgians and in, in, in a real bloodbath. Uh, in which Stalin was personally involved. And it just, just uh, brings me to the point that I want to uh, highlight on the dangers of propaganda, specifically in the context of youth. You know, the sort of the Western diplomatic bubble in this country or the English speaking, you know, sort of civil society bubble has regarded the problem of Stalin as some sort of folklore uh, phenomenon that is more or less characteristic to, to a bunch of odd uh, old man in gory who drinks strange toasts. And this, uh, this is a mistake. <laughs> as, as we now can see, in, in very, we can measure this in various ways. Uh, and I will show you one video where, where, it's, uh, where this is done not by old people at all. This is a mistake because young people are even more vulnerable to, 
to this uh, weaponization of memory. There are other, two other factors that faci have facilitated uh, the success with which this weaponization of Stalin's personality has taken place. One has to do with the reality, in, uh, political reality in Georgia and the ambivalence, at best, of the Georgian Dream government towards the Soviet Union and uh, attitude towards the Soviet Union and Soviet past. Um, one of the unspoken divisions in the Georgian society that you don't really hear every day on TV or nobody's debating that uh, on a daily basis, but nevertheless one of those unspoken divisions is the attitude towards the Soviet Union. What was the Soviet Union for Georgia? Was it evil or it's a mixed bag? Or there were so many good things in it, you know. They built metro or whatever, you know, and we had good movies and you know, and they liked our wine in Moscow and, and maybe we shouldn't be so negative about it. And, uh, and this division uh, has been exploited very successfully by uh, propaganda and uh, the Georgian government has embraced the ambivalence. And in some cases, actually, especially in the regions, has embraced the, weapon, uh, the, 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 the adversary's agenda. Uh, in some cases, as I say, for example, in Achaltsikhe, when a gigantic monument to Stalin was installed near, uh, near Achaltsikhe, uh, local, uh, local government supported that. In, uh, Prime Minister himself said that, you know, the second, we, we have debate every year whether it's May the 9th and, or May the 8th, and he said it's May the 9th, but anyway, this war, uh, this day is important because the Georgian won it. The Georgian won it. So, Another factor, so this, uh, the, 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 uh, the embrace and uh, the gamble with the ambivalence uh, towards the Soviet past, uh, which is exemplified in numerous uh, avenues, such as, for example, the uh, uh, increasingly difficult access to archives. Shouldn't uh, the security service of independent Georgia be interested to expose crimes of communism? Uh, but no, in Georgia, the security service that controls the archives, de facto, is making it increasingly difficult to access files, especially after 1947. So if documents are uh, less uh, of, um, if documents are less than 75 years old, uh, you can't get, so they will cross out everything uh, because they regard it as personal uh, for whatever reason, personal, personal. So we can't research events of 50s, we can't research the events of late 70s. There were some dramatic events related to Georgian language. Uh, in 1978, we can't research events of uh, 1980s, uh, the end of 1980s, the, uh, the massacre of 9th of April. Th these are all beyond the reach of researchers, which is uh, an opportunity again for uh, for uh, for the uh, weaponization of memory. Another factor that has ha that has in this reality facilitated uh, this success is the is the lack of appreciation of memory as a propaganda weapon by our Western friends. Uh, now, of course, since 2016, the, the word yeah, disinformation became so fashionable. Everybody is expert on disinformation, you know, and every week there is a conference on disinformation. Uh, and, uh, and the Western governments are spending money to counter disinformation. Uh, but uh, it's a broader problem, but this problem uh, has uh, is more acute in Georgia. The problem of the lack of uh, the, the recognition of m the importance of memory uh, in, in disinformation. You have a situation in which the Russian government itself says that the memory and the memory of the Soviet Union in particular is the matter of existential significance. You don't need secret intelligence reports to understand that. They say so and they act upon it. You know, uh, after all, this war is about memory, and they so, say so again. I mean, one of the first things they did in occupied Mariupol, uh, amongst you know others, was of course to destroy the Holodomor memorial, because for them Holodomor is a Western conspiracy to discredit Russia, right? And so, but nevertheless, the Western counter disinformation agenda, if you will, or efforts that the, the European Union and the United States, the British government also have uh, focused on is largely uh, about fact checking, debunking, you know, newsletters and endless conferences where more or less the same 
respectable <laughs> bubble of, of, of good people, you know, discuss complicated PowerPoint presentations and tell each other how smart they are. Whereas on the ground, you know, in, in, out in the street or in the village or in the town, uh, the situation is different and the products that this Western counter disinformation agenda creates uh, has very little impact on, uh, on the average person, on the public opinion. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the information warfare is about identity, yeah? Identity wars. Uh, and identity is defined by memory. <laughs> And we have a situation in which the adversary is very much about memory and is creating quote-unquote products uh, with memory at its heart that do manipulate people's uh, you know, emotions. And you have, on the other hand, situation in which the Western response is about creating sophisticated stuff which you know, is informative for me and, and you. Uh, and in Georgia should, is, is thought to be aiding policymakers to fine-tune their policies. But in Georgia, there is an additional problem that uh, as these uh, newsletters or the reports show, the policymakers themselves are often sources of dis Russian disinformation, such as even m most recently, uh, the Meta, the Facebook's parent company, uh, published investigations saying that the Georgian government's strategic communications department is the key institution essentially coordinating in relation to the, these March demonstrations, anti-Western uh, disinformation efforts. Essentially, this was the essence of the, of the, uh, of the investigation. So we have a, a situation like this in, in Georgia, in which uh, Stalin has been successfully weaponized as a, a tool to shape the future. Again, don't, uh, make no mistake. This is not about the past. The way they've uh, utilized Stalin is about the future because they've utilized the personality of Stalin as some sort of, uh, I should say, propaganda gateway. Because if you as a Georgian would agree to the proposition that you should be proud of Stalin for whatever reason, even a bit, right? For the reason of that he was the most powerful Georgian and he had good humor, whatever then, of course, are you more likely or less to be receptive to other sort of tactical narratives that the information warfare machine produces or conspiracy theories, such as, for example, that there is a, a, a Western conspiracy to destroy Orthodox Christianity. There is such conspiracy theory, very popular. <laughs> Uh, that there is such, uh, uh, such some people, you know, it also has anti-Semitic flavor uh, gathered to de design some conspiracy to destroy our church and our identity and, um, uh, and so forth. So uh, that also brings me now to the question of uh, the Georgian Orthodox Church. Georgian Orthodox Church, of course, it's, it's not a monolithic uh, institution and there are differences of opinion there, but increasingly uh, the voices that have emanated from the church into the society have been uh, replicating Russian uh, disinformation narratives on uh, especially uh, embracing the uh, LGBT propaganda uh, and the generally broadly speaking the anti-Western sort of uh, perspective that, that, uh, that, uh, that the West is a bigger threat than, than Russia. So you have tanks, Russian tanks, 40 kilometers from here. But the West is still, because they take away our soul. And the Russians don't take away our soul. <laughs> uh, and so, and now some of our Western friends have been puzzled what to do about it. And it's, it's certainly a problem. And uh, some of them, did, uh, some years ago, devised this project to fly around uh, Georgian Orthodox uh, Church bishops to Washington and Brussels and uh, you know, organized their group visits to NATO headquarters and US Congress and so forth. Uh, and they dubbed this as a sort of counter disinformation project. But of course, this changed nothing. And the same, uh, same I mean, you can just Google uh, the quotes of some of the bishops that say, say totally crazy stuff about Stalin also. <laughs> because Stalin is a, is a, is a really, a, Stalin is a, some, somehow like a flagship uh, flagship thing in this in this big project of uh, cultivating anti-Western Georgian uh, uh, nationalism. It's like an umbrella that brings everything together. That this image of this individual with big mustache that has, of course, one hundred percent sort of image recognition, if you will, or name recognition. Everybody knows who.
who this is. Everything can fit into this, and we can be proud of this. This, uh, you know, uh, this icon of of uh, of Stalin and and uh, the, uh, the, some of the more openly pro-Kremlin extremist groups in this country have openly and increasingly identified themselves with, with Stalin. They go to Moscow, Stalin's tomb, and they say, we shall end, we shall bring his struggle to the victorious, uh, victorious end. So, uh, so to, to, to cut it short, the, uh, the lack of appreciation of significance of this problem has uh, has been a great gift to to our adversary, who has who has been very successful at uh, um, at cultivating this uh, um, uh, project. And finally, uh, what also has enabled them to be so successful is what I call Georgia's amnesia with the 20th century. Uh, and it also, in part, this is legacy of Stalin himself. Because one of his legacies in Georgia is the reformatting of Georgian nationalism. He was personally so involved in Georgia uh, at various occasions. Um, and uh, after the Second World War, he was so much involved in this history textbook development and all that stuff. And so what, what actually happened was that the focus of Georgian sort of patriotic discourse shifted from modernity to Middle Ages, to 800 years ago. We can be proud of these kings and queens and, and so forth, and Russia will take care of modernity. And if you deal with, uh, you know, in social situations with Georgians, uh, and, you know, small talk will, will bring up this issue, the focus is somewhere, somewhere there, in, far away, not in the 20th century, uh, where Georgia had uh, a, a successful, successful uh, parliamentary democracy <laughs> with international recognition and women members of parliament and jury trials and you know elections and and, and uh, all that uh, and that something that was taken away by Stalin. So uh, this society has somehow not dealt with this. Uh, issue and that's what we're, my organization, So Love, designated by Russian MFA as Georgia's number one organization, Faking History, is trying to do. We just completed, and it hopefully will be out uh, by the end of the year. A popular science book, we, which was like a collaboration between uh, a group of researchers and uh, one of Georgia's most popular writers, Lasha Bogadze. Uh, uh, it's a book about Stalin's role in Georgia's history. And oddly enough, uh, it emerges that no one has written anything ever on this subject. Uh, from Stalinist perspectives, of course, there are many books. And by the way, we did research on, on uh, books about Stalin, and, and, and their statistic goes like this in the 90s, in 90s, in doing independence, <laughs> post, all of them pro-Stalin books. Yeah, and so this will be the first, uh, our working title is Joseph Stalin versus Georgia. <laughs> It will be a very provocative book, and hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll steer some discussion. We hope to have some campaign with it, uh, and somehow employ the same logic as, as the propaganda does, but in a reverse way. So for them, it's a, it's a gateway to inject their narratives, but it should be a gateway for us to revive the discussion about the 20th century, about the Soviet Union, uh, and about Stalin's personality. And, and somehow, as strange as it sounds, this society has never had a discussion about Stalin. Never. And probably now is the time to have it. And I'll end there. I'm sure you'll have questions. Yes, let's watch. Oh, so what is this video about? Um, it's, it's taken by I don't know whom. I, uh, it's taken around two, three months ago. So it's very recent. And, uh, and it's taken by somebody, I mean, somebody in a, in a real social situation, in, a, in, a, in Gori, in a restaurant. Everybody's young. And they just, uh, the rest you will see because it has English subtitles. And it just shows the, uh, shows the world outside the conference rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, 
For me, this video is very tragic. Uh, it's very tragic because, uh, of course, you all know uh, about uh, Stalin and his crimes, but this story of Stalin's crimes against Georgia are uh, unknown. And it's tragic because uh, Stalin, um, Stalin was really in, in a fundamental clash with the political idea of Georgia. The, the way he developed his career was incompatible with Georgia uh, as a modern political society, which is a Western idea, because this idea is uh, forged by uh, Westernizing figures in the Georgian history, the, the enlightened Georgian uh, uh, leaders of different political sort of tastes. Uh, and when Georgia was created, it, it so happened that uh, when Georgia, Georgian modern republic was created, it was social democrats, wrongly called Mensheviks, because, because wrongly called for, called for two reasons. First, because in the Russian Empire, when it was still nominally a one party, uh, the, the so-called Mensheviks, the minority, were in majority in Caucasus in, in, in Georgia. The Bolsheviks were marginals uh, in Georgia. And it's wrongly, they are wrongly called Mensheviks also because when Georgia became independent, they were called Social Democratic Party of Georgia. <laughs> so uh, it's just uh, this term really mirrors the, the Moscow or Kremlocentric environment in Western academia uh, on, that, uh, on the history of that period. Because the, because the Western academia is gluing a term uh, to, to a democratically elected government of Georgia that is just baseless. Just, just an example. And this is also tragic because, uh, uh, so as I said, Stalin was uh, in clash with this idea of modern democratic Georgia. He left Georgia in the first place in 1907 because he had lost. So there were, there were, there were a series of his political defeats at the end, at, and at the end, after this famous uh, bank robbery, not far from here, uh, when they were, they, they were going to have like a party court hearing because the Social Democratic Party, which was already split, but the, the then Mensheviks, and then it's correct to call them uh, at least uh, partially Mensheviks, uh, rejected, had rejected this armed sort of terrorist uh, things and, uh, and uh, methods. And so that's why he left, because of the defeat. And then Georgia is created as an independent country. He tries to steer trouble. The Bolsheviks are defeated, uh, you know, after, uh, again and again and again. Uh, and then he pushes for the invasion of Georgia. When Georgia gets uh, international recognition in January 1921, uh, in the international law of the time at the Paris Peace Conference, of course, there were, you know, there were so many state building projects of course, in that era, and the, the victorious nations uh, came up with this idea of de facto versus de, de jure recognition. De jure recognition was, of course, ticket to the League of Nations, which was a, some sort of, as, as you know, quasi-collective quasi security organization. And uh, de jure recognition was granted only to uh, state-building projects that proved their endurance and, you know, uh, governing themselves. Uh, and so, for, for example, Ukraine did, didn't exist, unfortunately, long enough to get the de jure recognition from Paris Peace Conference, and Georgia did. And in just a week after this uh, event, and there was a parade on Rustavele Avenue with the Western diplomatic representatives present, uh, Stalin engineered the Red Army invasion of his own native land. Uh, and his motivation has also not, uh, his motivation in engineering this uh, invasion has also not been discussed 
uh, in the Georgian public discourse, which is that uh, he is in the power struggle. The power struggle between him and Trotsky is sort of starting at that point. Lenin is still alive, but nevertheless. And if, he, if Stalin's native land, uh, Georgia, is outside and is you know, pursuing this capitalist, you know, whatever path, Oh, and God forbid with the social democrats who were ideological traitors, of course, of communism uh, at the top, then of course uh, his uh, chances would, would, and he was right in, in thinking that, would seriously suffer. So uh, there, are, there are various primary sources that show this debate between Stalin, Lenin and Trotsky. And Stalin and Trotsky were on the same side, by the way, uh, in that uh, uh, episode. Well, Lenin is against, and Stalin is just pushing, 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 pushing for this war to start as soon as possible. And uh, on February the 11th of 1921, uh, two Red Armies invaded Georgia from five sides, and Georgia fought alone uh, for a month with the French Navy taking part in the war in, uh, in Abkhazia, also not known. And this war in itself is absolutely unknown. In the, uh, not only in Russia, but in, uh, in elsewhere too, it's believed that somehow the fact that Georgia ended up in the Soviet Union, you know, how else could it be that Stalin was Georgian or John Kitzeberia, all these people were Georgian, and so it's just an, it was the result of the natural sequence of events that Georgia was a founding member of the Soviet Union, although it wasn't because it was through this Cauc Caucasian Federation, it's another subject. So occupation, when, when the Museum of Soviet Occupation were, was opened in Tbilisi, the, the Russian leadership was, went nuts. What occupation were they saying? What occupation? It's just absurd. Uh, because Stalin, Beria, that, that's what Putin said it on the record, by the way. So as if that Dzerzhinsky was Polish, that was in any way justification for, you know, multi remitter pact or whatever, you know. <laughs> so it, the Bolsheviks are a, a bunch of, uh, you know, eclectic uh, crazies or criminals. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> but please ask me anything you wish. Um, do you think uh, the current uh, uh, idealization of, ideation of Stalin mm -hmm. and that movement could come from uh, the dissatisfaction of the people of current circumstances in the political field or the social field, like, why, why are there so many people turning to Stalin? Like, because usually there's a cause for people getting affected by propaganda, some kind of mm -hmm. dissatis current dissatisfaction. So what do you think is the dissatisfaction for the people in Georgia? I think the key, uh, key uh, more or less I, I listed all the key reasons uh, for this. It's the amnesia, it's the ambivalence of the current Georgian government towards the Soviet past and therefore openness towards this propaganda. I think that is the key reason. Uh, and it is the uh, very disciplined, long-term and intensive uh, bombardment of the Georgian public space with, with the messages that then get mirrored in videos like this. Uh, I wouldn't link, you know, sort of the I don't know, food prizes with uh, <laughs> Stalin uh, sort of directly. It's, it's, the, it's the successful manipulation of the patriotic sentiment. Because Georgians, re Georgians regard themselves as patriotic. And patriotism requires symbols. So that's a great symbol. I, uh, I, as I mentioned to you, I, I gave a talk about uh, Stalin and Shakespeare uh, a year ago. And one of the things that I sort of conclu concluded about the, the character of Stalin. And it came out in, in something I observed several years ago in Russia. Uh, there were a, a bunch of management books that were issued. I saw them in, in, a, in the uh, airport bookstore um, about Stalin as a good manager. And uh, they were on the order of Steve Jobs types of books, right? And, and as I would, would leave through them, I'd look at the it was, it was hard to decide to open the labor camps, but uh, Comrade Stalin made the decision. And uh, the, the element, and it was, a, it was something that I was hearing at the same time about Putin, is he's saying, he's, he is a monster, but he knows how to make a decision. Who else in the world today, what other leader in the world today can make a decision? And it struck me reading these books that this was the reflection of a Russian middle manager or a businessman, a person who was really very uh, passive and really couldn't do much about his situation. 
he didn't have, uh, he couldn't make decisions because the, he was in a very locked, very closed system. And it's, Stalin is this, uh, like a lot of these idols, is that inside he's kind of empty. Just like you see in the images of him or in those the films about him, like the fall of Berlin. He's an icon, he's an idol, he's a pharaoh. And in that kind of figure, you could put, what, as you said, you could put whatever you want. And I think that the displacement and interest in Stalin it comes from a lot of sources. It comes from, from, the, from propaganda, uh, certainly. I agree with you with that. But I think it also comes from a kind of displaced agency. And that, that we have a, that they are able to put together this subject, this person that can be an ideal subject. I, I in some way, identify with, like as any subject does. But the West can't. There isn't a subject that they can, uh, they can offer. And I see, my personal feeling is that there's a lot of, sen there's a sense of, of passivity in, in Georgia now because of the political situation, but also because of the economic situation. I mean, I, the, the year we've been here, I spent a lot of time living in a village with friends. And, sure. But there just seems to be endless numbers of, of men and, and young men, able-bodied men, that have sent their sisters and their wives. Sure, sure, and sure, 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 absolutely. And I think that there's a, I mean, I remember we were in a swimming hole in Moody and this, uh, ch chatting with this young guy in Russian, uh, and he takes off his shirt and has a huge swastika uh, tattooed on his arm. <laughs> and it's the first time I've sat next to somebody and having a normal coat that has a swastika tattooed. For me, it's just a really <laughs> very, very uh, uncomfortable thing. Sweet fellow, perfectly. And there's a, I wonder if there isn't, this here as well. There's a sense of a lack of agency. That you ignorance, have, you yeah, ignorance. Patriotism, yeah. but you have no focal point. Yes, and, this is a and, th and that is why, again, as I said, uh, that is why uh, th this uh, question of amnesia with the 20th century uh, comes into play. And, and there, I think, a fair analogy, uh, of course, there is no, it's not identical because no country is identical, but still fair analogy would be uh, uh, to draw a parallel with, with the Baltic states for Georgia, w which, which, uh, <coughs> which we often, in various uh, issues, compare Georgia with. And uh, in, a, in an oversimplified terms, uh, the identity of, of an ordinary Lithuanian, the historical identity, uh, again in oversimplified terms, is that we had our own country, which by the standards of the time was doing more or less okay. And then these guys came, these guys met, signed some papers, and then these other guys in leather jackets and guns came and destroyed our country and killed a good portion of our population. And now we're somehow trying to get, get back on track. And that narrative, even though it would be absolutely fair mm -hmm. to, to, uh, uh, to be at the heart of Georgian, uh, modern Georgian identity, that is completely absent. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, that, again, that is an opportunity. Uh, perhaps for me, the, the best figure that explains the extent of uh, the Soviet Union's uh, Soviet Union rupturing the social fabric of the Georgian society is the statistic of what happened to the democratically elected members of Georgian parliament. There were seven parties in Georgian parliament. There were uh, parliamentary elections in 1919, five women of which two were shot. Uh, and there were 130 members, okay? So in 1921, when the occupation started, in, on March the 17th, when the uh, part of the government uh, emigrate, uh, left to France, uh, uh, there were 139 people who were either sitting or former members. There were some by-elections meanwhile, and a couple of people lost seats. So there were 139 sitting or, uh, uh, sitting or former MPs, of which 108 stayed in Georgia, of which 51 were shot and 37 exiled, of which five died in exile. And, and even though, I mean, it's, one may say it's cherry picking, but it really illustrates the, the, the viciousness with which Stalin <laughs> sort of smashed this project of Georgia being European democratic rule of law <laughs> country. Uh, because the ideas on which that country, the Democratic Republic of Georgia, was based on 
were Western ideas. They were about rule of law and human rights and pluralism and all that. And these ideas were put to work, one can say, more successfully than, uh, than today. The, the caliber of political competition in, in parliament and, and, the, and the judiciary and the jury trials and, and when, when you sort of try to reconstruct how things work, you know, without idealization, of course, you know, small nations tend to idealize their past uh, as well. Uh, it's just mind-blowing. Uh, what was taken away from Georgia by Stalin <laughs> because of his, because of his uh, focus on his own political agenda which was incompatible with this country, Georgia, existing. And as uh, somebody from uh, Britain whose name was Ramsay MacDonald, <laughs> first Labour Prime Minister, who came here <laughs> as a Labour leader in 1920, as he wrote uh, after returning to the UK, he said there, ex there exists today no more serious challenge to Soviet Russia than the socialist government of Georgia, uh, Ramsay McDonald said. Yeah. And, then, and this, this fundamental clash between the personality of Stalin and the political idea of Georgia, this story has never been told. So until, now, until now. <laughs> what's, the, what's your plan for trying to get this into the school history books? So we, we, it will be hard to uh, do it with the, this government, but what we try to, what we aim to do is to work with uh, independent teachers associations. Uh, they are independent teachers associa associations to recommend to their members this as a supplementary reading at schools, which still would be a, a successful thing. And in the future, of course, we'll, but uh, this can be a more immediate, uh, this is a more immediately achievable objective. Yeah. So, I am trying to come to terms with the fact that you were talking about the amnesia that exists now mm -hmm. in the 20th century, but what about the 20th century? You were now to 1956, and the 20th Congress of the Communist mm -hmm. Party had to push up and fall and the rehabilitation of all the press and Gula. Um, the Georgians, mm -hmm. met, you know, they kept worshipping Stalin. You know, the first place the tourists were taken to was Gori. He, he was idolized all the way through, despite the fact that millions of Georgians perished in Gula. Uh, not, not millions, but so many. <laughs> there's this schism um, that... Um, so what's your question? The question is, um, how would you explain that that was happening in the 20th century? Really sort of yes, as I said, as I said, this thing existed uh, before, but with time, why did it exist? Again, it, because of Stalin's Georgian origins. Just there is no other reason. There is no. There is uh, Stalin's Georgian origin. Right. Stalin's Georgian origin, and the small nation thing. He was so powerful. He won the war. You know, it's just this, as simple as it gets. This, it's so simple, it's almost genius. This narrative that now is amplified, of course. Small town boy who made it so big, you know, who won the war. But again, there it's also, the uh, thing is that the war in this mythology, of course, starts in 1941. Not this, this period between 39 and 41 is blank, it's white. Nothing, nothing, nothing is happening. Everyone's just sitting there and just looking in the, in the ceiling, you know. Uh, and uh, he was the most powerful Georgian ever. In disinformation, power is asset. He was so powerful. He was from small town and he ruled them all. He showed them all. And let's be proud. Uh, by amnesia, by amnesia I, I mostly meant, however, I mostly meant the, the amnesia with, uh, with uh, his deeds and and, and what he did in, when he was alive, and what he did to independent Georgia. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah, the, the amnesia with uh, with the story of Stalin's uh, uh, impact on Georgian history. That's what I meant. Can we say then that there's not one particular source or kind of top-down figure that is driving this pro-Stalin sentiment? That it's kind of like a a wheel that just keeps growing, or some kind of Social yeah. No, there are media outlets. So the, the, by propaganda, of course, this propaganda has faces, and there are organized organizations uh, that 
are known for uh, sort of disseminating these narratives, and some of them have there are TV stations, there are newspapers, there are uh, uh, Facebook uh, groups and uh, pages. Uh, there is an ecosystem of, of this propaganda, and there you can see on TikTok a lot of videos on TikTok, and there you can see uh, more or less the, uh, the identical uh, narratives recycled all the time, all the time, uh, betting on this pride, small nation pride thing, and church Christianity, Christianity. Yeah. Like the uh, Georgian Dream MP, a couple, two years ago, he bought a painting by Stalin, or I, I, I don't know, something was. Something was, uh, so the, the journalist goes up to this Georgian Dream MP and asks him, so what about this painting or whatever, it doesn't really matter what was the occasion, but then he justifies this and he says, oh, because he was, he was so educated, he was a great patriot, and he was a believer, he was Christian, right? As it says an MP who is like, you know, 60 years old, who should be a respectable guy, a businessman from, you know, Zestaponi and so on. Yeah. You mentioned the amnesia, so I was wondering, there's an amnesia of what Stalin did in Georgia. Yes, or yes. Is there like, is there an understanding of history of uh, the atrocities Stalin committed in like other Soviet, at the time Soviet countries like the Baltic? <laughs> so that is, uh, so the, the 1937 and the Stalin's purges, they are more or less known. Yeah, it's not that, so in this poll that I cited, uh, also, the uh, large portion of, of the respondents say that he was a tyrant. But it doesn't mean they don't like him, because he was a tyrant, but he was so powerful. And as uh, we had an event uh, last year ago with Memorial, uh, on the day they got Nobel Prize, we had a conference here, and uh, as, uh, as its director said, uh, Yelena Zemkova, she said that the Stalin's terror is viewed as some sort of natural disaster. You know. Just, no one is responsible. It just happened. It's a hurricane. It just happened and no one is respons responsible for, for, for this. And more or less uh, the attitude towards the purges of 1930s is f like that in Georgia too. Like in Russia. In, uh, there, there is similarity. That it just, just, those were the times. You know, it just happened so. What can we do? <laughs> Insight how Stalin continued to break the ranges of Georgia, like Al Qaeda, who right. different relationship with Georgia itself, and also with the Soviet Union. Sure. So, uh, a small terminological correction: occupied regions. <laughs> it's a status neutral uh, terminology that is inaccurate. Uh, a very interesting question. So, in uh, so two different ca uh, cases. Of course, in uh, South Ossetia, it's Khinwali region, <laughs> in, in this proxy uh, crazy regime that there is, they want to, they, 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 there is this like a provincial conspiracy crazy stuff that Stalin was in fact Ossetian. You may have heard of it, that Stalin was Ossetian. The Georgians stole Stalin from us, you know. <laughs> so they had, the, occasionally they have these movements to rename their capital into Stalin, Stalinir, whatever, yeah, so. And so the, that's the attitude in South Ossetia very shortly. Uh, and in Abkhazia it's more, uh, more uh, um, it's, it's totally different. Uh, so the, uh, the mythology of, uh, uh, that was engineered in Soviet uh, period uh, that served as a basis for Abkhaz ethno-nationalism against Georgians uh, claimed that Stalin and Beria, in particular Beria, but you know Beria was Stalin's man, uh, they, uh, they, they uh, absorbed Abkhazia into Georgia as Georgian nationalists. So, so they were projecting Georgian nationalism on Abkhazia because they were Georgians. That's the mythology. That, uh, that, that Beria settled some Georgians, uh, ethnic Georgians, the, to Abkhazia, which is partially true. Uh, but for, for, uh, for other reasons, um, of course, because both destroyed independent uh, Georgia. But uh, there is also a claim that Abkhazia was a Soviet republic, and then Stalin downgraded, Stalin Beria downgraded its uh, 
legal status in the Soviet federalism to make it autonomy of Georgia, and so therefore they are uh, they are not really liked just in in this Abkhaz uh, context. But there too, and we're actually working on on another project. Uh, there too, it, it is just striking how powerful uh, propaganda can be. And it is possible to fool a lot of people for a very long time. It is possible. And, uh, and uh, in Abkhazia in particular, uh, one of the founding myths of this uh, chauvinism against Georgians that KGB cultivated, to be honest, uh, throughout decades, is that Nestor Lakoba, who was the leader of uh, Abkhaz, uh, uh, one of the leaders of Ab com local communists, and the struggle of local communists against the government of Noe Jordania, that this struggle at the same time was the struggle of Abkhaz against the Georgian oppression. That's the mythology. And uh, it emerges that the key leaders of the Bolsheviks in Abkhazia who fought against Georgia were Georgians, ethnic Georgians. And the key figures on the Georgian side who fought against Bolsheviks were Abkhaz. So <laughs> the, the, the head of the local counterintelligence service who rooted out Bolsheviks from Abkhazia and defeated them. That's why the war became necessary in the first place because the Bolsheviks were defeated in Georgia. And this, this hope for internal upheaval and revolution and all that, uprising of workers uh, and so on, that, that was just not, not coming because the Bolsheviks were not popular, they were hated, and they lost. And they were defeated whenever they had uh, attempts of armed, uh, uh, sort of attempts to overthrow the democratically elected government. Uh, and so it was the, uh, <laughs> the other way around. Then there is mythology that uh, there was this rebellion and these glorious communist peasants, they overthrow, they, they Sovietized Abkhazia. And there, this term is also like breakaway. It's, it's a euphemism for occupation because what Soviet, Sovietization is, is a term invented by communists to, to veal the fact of invasion and military aggression. Because when army of one country crosses the border of uh, another that it itself recognizes <laughs> and then occupies it through the, the use of force, that is called occupation, not Sovietization, whatever that is. So, uh, and in this mythology, there was this glorious communist peasants who rebelled and Sovietized Abkhazia. Well, um, in 1921, uh, there was one front of the Georgian-Russian war was in Abkhazia. The ninth Russian Red Army invaded Georgia from Abkhazia. It was all Russians and all the units, the strength, the arms, the battles, everything is known, uh, the commanders. Uh, from both sides, and it was the Russian Red Army, the Ninth Army, and it was the Georgian Army and the People's Guard, and that's it. <laughs> so these uh, communist rebels are nowhere. I, we just uh, processed some books and, and uh, reports, and even we have reports and the orders of the Red Army archival materials, commander reports, the orders of the uh, high command. We have, uh, there was a 1960s uh, research on specifically on the Georgian-Russian war, of the general staff of the Soviet army. Where are these rebels? There are no rebels, it's the Russian Red Army. It's one country occupying the, another. So this, this mythology is just, just, just somehow was grown, 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 and it became the, the religion in, in uh, Abkhazia that was later uh, utilized by Russia when it, oh, again, with its army intervened there in 92, 93, but that's another story. <laughs> Please. Uh, to what extent is the enduring influence on Georgian politics making it easier for Russia to carry out this change in narrative? Uh, to what extent? Are the enduring influence on Yes. <laughs> sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a very political question and it's, it's, it's a great enabler. I mean, uh, there are people who believe he's just a Russian asset. Uh, and without entering that discussion, I think his steps have uh, enabled the projection of Russian influence in Georgia. Uh, enormously. And that's what I can say, unfortunately. He comes from that world. He is from there. You know, he, he believes in crazy stuff also. Like the, he, he once asked someone that, is it true that Mossad engineered 9-11? <laughs> like, 
that kind of stuff. And it's publicly known, so it's not a secret. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, any other questions? You may have on Stalin. Maybe, maybe he still was a great guy. What do you think? <laughs> he had very dark sense of humor. You have seen dark, uh, The Death of Stalin, the British movie. Yeah, if you haven't, do see it. It's great. It's an achievement to, to make something, uh, make a film about such a tragedy, to make it funny but not offensive. So, I like it. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for your view. I think I speak for everyone in saying that we have learned so much about the weaponization of Stalin's memory um, and the rehabilitation and the great danger that it presents for Jordan society. So, thank you everyone for joining. And I think if you'll join me in a fine round of applause with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I hope it was useful.